the interaction of using the arm and seeing through the eyes of a camera is not simple. It's like uh, going out to drive a semi truck with the, never having driven one before. The truck works, but learning how to shift 18 gears is not so easy. If working properly, Phoenix's robotic arm will drop ice samples into a device called a Thermal and Evolved Gas Analyzer, or TIGA for short. TIGA has eight tiny ovens, about the size of an ink cartridge in a ballpoint pen. Not unlike this one. Once a sample is successfully sealed in an oven, the temperature is slowly raised at a constant rate. As the temperature edges up to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, the ice and other volatile materials in the sample vaporize into a stream of gases. So if you think about what happens in your kitchen when you put, say, some sort of food in the, in the oven and you start to heat it up, it's cooking nicely at 200, 300, 400 degrees, but if you start to crank that oven up 800, 900 degrees, thousand degrees, what's going to happen to the organic materials in there? Where well, they're going to turn to smoke, they're going to come out and like in my kitchen, they're going to set off the smoke alarm and you're going to be doing an experiment just like Tiga. Roasting the samples of soil and ice at 1800 degrees releases what are called evolved gases. A mass spectrometer will then scan these gases for minute quantities of hydrogen, oxygen, carbon and nitrogen, the elements of life. But Phoenix's sophisticated instruments do have a limit. Each of its eight ovens can be used only once. So as it digs down, it will take samples at eight different depths. NASA hopes to then map the changing character of the ice. Scientists hope these precise measurements will reveal the evolution of water on the planet and possibly uncover the existence of life. To get a head start on the kind of data the lander might send back, the Phoenix scientists set out to replicate their experiments here on Earth. The geology of Mars and Earth is surprisingly similar. Mars is a cold, dry desert landscape of sand and rocks. But both planets share land features like volcanoes, canyons, and valleys. This is the most Mars-like place on Earth, the Antarctic. Mars, when it was at its warmest and wettest, would have been like Earth at its coldest and driest. That's why, to me, going to the dry valleys of Antarctica is the next best thing to go to Mars. Here, Chris McKay and Peter Smith are going to do on Earth what Phoenix will be doing on Mars. The idea is to make the connection between what Phoenix will measure on Mars with what Phoenix would measure in the dry valleys of Antarctica. They're digging down to ice to see if life, or the conditions for life, exists in this inhospitable terrain. We go from a surface soil, which is kind of reddish, and definitely of a different character than the lower soils, and we're going to measure layer by layer down to ice. We're using instruments on, our, on the deck of the spacecraft, and our robotic arm scoops up samples as it digs down and presents them to the science instruments, which analyze them right there on Mars. I think just by looking at these soils here, you can tell that liquid water's been at work. If we could see that on Mars, we have a place where we have a habitable zone and perhaps a place where life could live. McKay and Smith's analysis of Antarctic ice reveals that life can exist in the sub-zero temperatures found on Mars. It's really quite phenomenal what we can find in the dry valleys and in the high Arctic, how life can make do with small, transient amounts of liquid water. These life forms are called extremophiles. They're microscopic bacteria that thrive in extreme environments. They were first discovered 40 years ago 
in the 160-degree hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Since then, others have been found living deep under the ocean, in super saline environments, even in the uranium-rich pools of water in nuclear power stations. But it's the ones that live in the sub-zero temperatures of Antarctic ice that interest the Phoenix team. They reason that if microbes can be found here, then why not on Mars? So if Phoenix finds ice, it might just find evidence of life locked inside it. The other remarkable thing about polar deserts is how well ice and cold in general preserves evidence of life. We know that you can go up into permafrost in Siberia and dig out mammoths that have been frozen for 10,000 years or more. On Mars, we, we're hoping for the same effect. We're hoping to find, frozen in the ice on Mars, evidence of life that may have been preserved maybe for millions, but maybe even also for billions of years. Frozen micro-Martian mammoths, if you will. Not only will Phoenix detect changes in atmosphere and temperature, it has the ability to identify organics, crucial to the search for life. Our mission was designed specifically to touch water in the form of ice and to try and understand the properties of that ice, its history, its uh, interaction with the soil, its interaction with the atmosphere, and really explore it, the question of is there or was there ever life on Mars? By analyzing the soil samples, Phoenix might finally identify the building blocks of life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen on Mars. And if we saw the organic materials, energy sources, and uh, liquid water present in the past, we would say this is a habitable zone, and perhaps some sort of Martian life could live there. With the Phoenix mission, NASA's 30-year search for water on Mars could finally come to an end. And by following the water, it might just find life. Today, NASA's Phoenix lander completes its nine-month-long journey to Mars. It now begins its hunt for life, or at least an environment that could have once supported life. But does NASA really think it can find this on the frozen wastelands of Mars? The answer is yes. This is because of an accidental discovery made by the rover Spirit. Spirit's most significant scientific discovery came 1,200 days into its 90-day mission. In 2007, a moving part on Spirit malfunctions. The failure leads to the best evidence yet that Mars was once capable of supporting life. The right front wheel on Spirit doesn't turn anymore. It's failed. But the one good thing, the silver lining here, is that as we drive and we drag that wheel through the soil, we dig a trench. And every now and then, something interesting will pop up in the bottom of that trench. X-ray analysis of a patch of soil churned up by the stuck wheel yields unexpected results. It is composed of about 90% pure silica. That was just a complete unexpected discovery, pure serendipity, and frankly, if the right front wheel had been working properly, we might not have found it. This $320 million breakdown reveals more evidence of water. On Earth, high levels of silica occur in only two places, hot springs or fumaroles. Both environments bubble with water and life. The thing that's important about the silica discovery is that you can go to hot springs and you can go to fumaroles on Earth, and in both instances, they're teeming with microbial life. Spirit has discovered evidence of a habitable zone on Mars, a place where extremophiles like those on Earth could have thrived and may even exist today. What's more, the idea of Martian life is backed up by the four billion year old Allen Hills meteorite. Structures inside it reveal what some believe 
is the first real evidence of Martian life forms. David McKay heads the team that made the discovery. We discovered in Allen Hills what we concluded was strong evidence for past life. That evidence consisted of, number one, some little tiny fossil-like features that are similar to fossils known to occur on Earth. Uh, number two, we found that there were crystals made of an iron oxide, which are also always associated with uh, bacteria on Earth. McKay and his team believe that the Allen Hills meteorite is proof that life existed on Mars. When they announced their discovery in 1997, most scientists were skeptical. The discovery of fossils in the Martian meteorite was always problematical. They weren't really biological structures, they were just little round and little oval shaped things. And people quickly realized that if you pick up any piece of rock or dirt and examine it at that scale, you often see little round and little oval like structures that have nothing to do with biology. But Spirit's discovery of silica on Mars has reopened the debate about Martian microbes. If extremophiles can be found in similar environments on Earth, then why not on Mars? Will Phoenix find the evidence that backs up McKay's belief that life existed on Mars? If it does, the implications will be profound. You may think that if we find life on Mars and it's just microbes, who cares? Why is that important? But within those microbes could be the potential for all of the richness and complexity of life like we see on Earth. In the same sense that an acorn is an oak tree, a single organism on Mars could represent the potential for complex ecosystems for animals and plants and even human-like intelligence. Even if on Mars that seed didn't grow to its full potential, if the acorn didn't become an oak tree, it's still interesting because it tells us that on other worlds, on other stars, it would have fully developed. We're not alone. It's an astonishing prospect, one that the Phoenix mission is poised to solve. Well, when Phoenix lands down, on Mars and sends back its first signal that it lands successfully, I will breathe a five-year-long sigh of relief. But before NASA's latest probe can answer tough questions about life and our place in the universe, it has to land. And that may be the biggest challenge it faces. NASA's latest mission to Mars will try to answer some fundamental questions about the red planet and the nature of life in the universe. When Phoenix begins searching ice for traces of life, it takes us closer to understanding our place in the solar system. Is life on Earth a quadrillion to one miracle? Or does it appear wherever and whenever the circumstances are right? Before it can answer these questions, Phoenix has to safely get to Mars. Just a few hours ago, NASA's probe began its final approach to the planet. Station here home. At this point, we have a strong signal from Phoenix via Odyssey. And the team at JPL began slowing the spacecraft down for a soft landing on the planet's surface. It lost the X-band signal from the DSN, does indicate an expected crew stage separation. This man is responsible for bringing its speed down from 74,000 to five and a half miles an hour. He's Gentry Lee. The risky part of the mission begins as we near Mars. When we hit the top of the atmosphere, the process of slowing down begins. And in that six to seven minutes, we slow down from tens of thousands of miles an hour 
to single digits, Mao.